Welcome to Inside Sponsorship, the show that provides sponsorship professionals with advice, insights and news so they can maximise their commercial programmes and achieve best practice. Supernova Comic Con and Gaming Expo has been the welcoming home of Australia's pop culture fandom since 2000, a place where fans inspired by imaginary worlds emanating from comics, sci-fi, fantasy, anime, gaming, nostalgia and literature have been able to come together to celebrate, a place to rejoice in cosplay, which is a hybrid of costume, roleplay and also a place just to express their inner geek and their inner child. What used to be considered nerdy and not really mainstream has well and truly shifted into the spotlight in recent times. Some of that can be attributed to the rise in popularity of esports, which we've covered in depth in two previous episodes, as well as the never-ending releases of superhero movies in recent times. At Supernova, superstar celebrities, fan clubs, exciting exhibitors and exclusives have been woven in with entertainment technology, collectibles and toys. And whether they are 7 or 70, Supernova boasts an incredibly engaged audience who have huge passion for the content and that presents a great opportunity for brands through sponsorship. I'm your host, Daniel Oyston, and welcome to episode 59 of Inside Sponsorship, where we take you inside the sponsorship and commercial programs of both rights holders and brands right around the world. It's great to have you listening into the show. No shout outs this time, which is very sad. So if you're listening and you haven't gotten in touch, be sure to shoot me a message on LinkedIn or email using daniel at sponsor.net. We'd love to hear where you work and what you love about the show. In this episode, we go inside sponsorship at Supernova and hear from Patrick Bradley, who is responsible for business development brand partnerships. But first, the FIFA World Cup has finished up, and while the action on the field was awesome, Sam Irvine, sponsor's GM product, loved what Budweiser did as an official partner of the tournament. And Sam's blogged about some of Budweiser's activations and highlighted some of the things that we can all learn from them. Here's Sam. Sam Irvine, your blog this week is looking at the FIFA World Cup 2018, which is, by the time this show comes out, would have finished. Yes. Who won? Uh, France? Croatia won. Okay, everyone? One all extra time, maybe shootout. Shootout. Everyone's laughing because France (laughs) has definitely won the game because based on your blog right at the end, it says you're going for England, and we know now that England are out. So if you've done the opposite of what Sam says, you should be smiling. But no, I'll, put, I'll take that blame. It's not coming home, England. I'm sorry. In, in all seriousness, you've taken a look at how Budweiser has overcome what you might call the bleak commercial opportunities mm. because it's, it's not such a... No, the market's different in that it's part. It's not a commercial hotbed, Russia. Let's mm. yeah, let's not kill ourselves. Yeah. So let let's jump into it. What have you had a look at? How have you framed it? Well, what it's funny. I th- I remember a couple of months ago, I, I was reading a couple a few things around uh, FIFA partnerships and how the next two World Cups, that being Russia and then Qatar after it, will be a, a whole different ball game. Pardon the pun for for them compared to previous um additions given that they've been in either in america or france or germany you know places that really are quite westernized when it comes to commercial opportunities um they're quite western sponsors like coca-cola budweiser um uh, any of the technology companies are, are sort of used to dealing with those western markets and so when you're talking about even though it is a world game and it's it's the biggest and you know world event ever you still need that ability to be able to talk to the local market and so that's the things I was reading was that um, it would be limited for these sponsors and it might not be, they might not see the outcomes that they were hoping from from other and maybe future editions. So for me to see then what Budweiser has been doing, a lot of it digital, a little bit of it in, in-house or on screen for us watching it over here in Australia, has I've been really blown away and, they, and really take their hat off. I want to take my hat off to them and in what they've done in really not, it doesn't feel like they've, sort of taken a step back because it's Russia or because it's a totally different sort of culture over there at all. And and so I had there's about three or four key things that sort of stuck out to me. Yeah, awesome. And we're going to jump in and, and we're going to talk through the different elements of their campaign. And it strikes me as that these days, and we're very lucky because we've got you know, such access to more digital opportunities so we can extend our reach and our activations outside of an event like this online and reach people instantly right around mm. the world which was you know 30 40 years ago is probably quite hard well yeah. it would have been mm. very hard and, and much more localized campaigns but we're going to look through a couple of things there's some awesome videos so people will need to head to sponsor.net yeah. head to the blog to check out these videos but we think that there's or you think that there's a couple of things in in each video 
that really highlight what Budweiser have activated and executed well that we can all learn off. Yeah, definitely. And and wouldn't it be great if we all had that, uh, you know, the budget, the of budget. Budweiser <laughs> and the reach or if we worked with partners like Budweiser. But for me, they all gave small little lessons that you can take and apply at any level, no matter sort of, sort of where you are. So for the first one for me was have a, a global campaign, but create targeted markets as well or identify and talk to those targeted markets. And for Budweiser and FIFA, this was um, a campaign called Light Up the FIFA World Cup. It was based around some cups that eventually light up by noise you make and things like that. But not just the gimmick element. What I really loved is that they created a really big launch campaign that appealed to the whole global market. It wasn't specifically focused on particular nations, ambassadors, or anything like that. It could, you could have been a sports fan of any sport, of any sort of background, and you would have enjoyed their launch. You would have enjoyed the videos and the content that were coming around that global campaign. But then taking that next step and going, all right, now we actually have to speak to the Asian market, to the Australasian market for a wider experience. We also then need to identify South America as a key different market to North America. Now that North America is not in the World Cup, we need to sort of approach it differently. And so that's where I was blown away. Their use of different content, different videos, different ambassadors at that targeted level was where I really um, think we could take lots of lessons out of this. And so if you bring it back to a local level or even, uh, you know, national or or state to be able to go, all right, we, we want to tell a message that applies to our whole stakeholder base, but then piece out little bits that actually you can talk to individual stakeholders about, I think. Mm. Very good. So, so while it's a global partnership, figure out how you can apply it uh, locally mm. while still leveraging, obviously, yeah. the global. Yeah. Make it relevant. Sounds difficult, but definitely <laughs> doable. And like we said, if you've got the budget like Budweiser, <laughs> up, you can't miss that opportunity to do that. No, What's definitely. the second one? Fan engagement? So the second one for me was fan engagement, but but in public places, right? So not just at games or not just at pre-organized events. Um, and, and if this, I just love this video. So as Daniel's already said, jump on it and try and, and have a look too. But just for those listening in the uh, audio format at the moment, there's a little video where there's a vending machine in a number of public spaces, not just in an Asian country or a South American, but probably 10 different or uh, you know um, countries there where you would go up and you, you go to get a beer from this uh, you know, vending machine, but it would ask you to cheer. And the louder you cheered, the more likely you were to get a beer. But and not if you just didn't that, cheer, you got feedback that it wasn't good enough, yeah, right? You yeah. did, yeah, exactly. So that worked in both both uh, directions. But those that actually showed some passion, showed you know more than just the cheering ability, were, got given free tickets to the World Cup, and then their reaction was just so infectious. The some of the tears, some of the over overwhelming joy that they had from that experience. And some of it could well have been staged. Who knows? The production values were amazing, mm. but the number of people in the background videoing at the yes. time, just the random public capturing that, that would have been then on shared by them, was just would have been mental. So they're standing in front of a vending machine. They're going to cheer maybe like a goal's just been scored. So we're very excited about this part of the interview, listeners, because Sam is now going to demonstrate how <laughs> he would no have way. cheered in, in front of the vending machine. No? <laughs> no way. Okay, so, that's unfortunate. Very disappointing for our listeners. We are, And so what we've seen then, though, is that ability to, to create your own content and to do it in a public space, though, where that organic content is almost even more valuable. Infectious. Yeah. And then other people mm. come up, they yeah. cheer, why are you doing it? Mm. Let's make sure we look this up online. Yeah. Let's yeah. share it. Let's mm. have a discussion. Mm. Yep, very no, cool. Exactly. And really coolly, you also, I assume you also got a beer or you get a beer out of this vending machine. It's not just giving World Cup bonus. tickets, but it didn't actually, I don't think that video actually showed anybody drinking the beer. No, no. But they're quite careful with that. I think mm. they, and, and so what I really think as, as a general rights holder or a brand at, at different levels, the part we can take out of that, public activations are done all the time everywhere, right? And it's probably not the first surprise and delight you've ever seen. But the way they did it around different regions, um, you know, different outcomes, being able to utilize that public to on-sell that, really, I think, as a local rights holder or brand, that whole surprise and delight is totally invaluable. Mm. I I was just going to make the point that they probably engaged with the product and had a beer and stuff, and then I just... Realise it was in a public place, right? So you probably don't want the, the twelve year olds going up and cheering for a bit. No, South America, anything goes. Yeah, so. Very good. Number three. For me, this is a really big one too, around leveraging current fans. Now brands are really good at that in general, right? Like you you obviously you work with the rights holder because they have a market space already. They already have an engaged um, market that's that's listening or, or or talking to them or, or willing to sort of hear messaging from 
your partners. But this video, this is probably my favorite. I love it. I love this one. (laughs) It's and so what it was uh, once again for those listening on audio. um, There's a glass box. And there's two really, really passionate fans from the same country and they've got some headphones on and they've got their light up the cup, cups sitting next to them and they're sitting there not lighting up because there's no noise. But, the, but, but they're in a room. In a room surrounded yeah. by fans that are going <laughs> off and there's a game going on. I don't know if it's live or if it's a replay. Might be qualifiers. It's, yeah. It's and, probably the last game to see if you qualify yeah, maybe. And yeah. so some of these country would have been a big deal. And But they've got to cheer no, they don't, can't cheer. They've got to cheer quietly for, you know. The can't and, make any and sound noise. whatsoever. So they're trying to give high fives that are really soft and they're just, they're jumping around the room but keeping their, like, holding their breath and, and it's just so engaged. Because you put yourself, as an avid fan my, myself, you put yourself in that situation. How long would you have lasted? Oh, first... First, first penalty, I probably would have struggled. I would never put myself in that situation. <laughs> no, I'm like, you're, no, you're not going to last, mate. Just no, go out exactly. and enjoy the game yeah. with everyone else. And so for me, it was, um, once again, a piece of content that uh, was so engaging and could be – it was applied. There was probably six different couples that sort of came in, couple, uh, coupled up people, and – different countries, different reactions, um, but the same thing, same outcome, really, really um, great content that you could piece up per region. Yeah. If certain regions, you know, only wanted to show the English fans in England or whatever it might be, mm. but just engaging that passion with those current fans. We've all been in that position where you wanted to scream at the TV or maybe we all haven't, but I, I know I have. Or Multiple you wanted to really, the game. <laughs> And you really wanted to celebrate and be part of it and to be held back. I think it's that great little challenge that we've all gone, had to take our hat off to these people who have succeeded. So if they succeeded T- too, they got tickets. Uh, oh, so there was a, a win for them out of it. Uh, it's, we didn't see any Australians in there, but no. surely Australians would be very, very good at this around football, soccer, because of how many late night games we have to watch and not wake our partners and kids up in the house. Lying Maybe that's why there is no Australians. On. They just be handing tickets out, <laughs> hand over fist for Australians. We're just too, uh, yeah, but we're not controlled at all as a culture, I've spent, we, I've so. spent many a morning at 3am watching football, screaming into cushions and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jess. And so for me, really taking this sort of lesson is really applicable at, at any level. We did, we, we're not all going to have big glass boxes um, and, and really cool pr- productive um, production values that we can embed in videos or content. But what we are going to have is fans that are engaged and, and we can really sort of tap into that level of engagement, that passion, create content out of that. So yep. it's nothing really new, but the way they, they did it in a, in a slightly different fashion for me was um, was a really, really cool, engaging way yep. to use those current fans. But those three uh, examples, leveraging current fans, uh, fan engagement in public places, and then the global partnership, but, you know, targeted chunking market, it up yep. in, in targeted market, it's really just the tip of the iceberg for their whole partnership right goodness me when you look at all the other uh, you know above the line advertising marketing they they were doing as well so i only saw a couple of tvcs but there were also print adverts elsewhere magazine adverts there was other social media elements to it so it wasn't just the organic growth of their you know youtube videos or whatever it might be they obviously had invested big time in in other areas plus not even to think of the fact of how much money they would have had to pay Mm. to be an official partner of fifa but you're right. It's just the tip of the iceberg, but goodness, if you could, as a rights holder or a brand, ele- harness those three elements really well in, in a local campaign, you're going to get some great results. And I think um, hats off to Budweiser, hats off to some of the other partners uh, in FIFA that have done a relatively good job, but I, I really think FIFA, um, Budweiser has set the bar. Very awesome. good. And if you want to check out those videos, just head to sponsor.net, head, head to the blog section. Again, commiserations to Croatia because as I read the last <laughs> line of this blog, it says, Go England. I say that with hesitation, rightly so in hindsight, after Australia has been knocked out. Congratulations, France. Commiserations to Croatia. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Sam. Thanks, Daniel. Supernova Comic Con and Gaming Expo has been the welcoming home of Australia's pop culture fandom since 2000. Whether they are 7 or 70, Supernova boasts an incredibly engaged audience who have a huge passion for the content and that presents a great opportunity for brands through sponsorship. Patrick Bradley, who is responsible for business development brand partnerships, now joins us to take us inside sponsorship at Supernova. Here's Patrick. Patrick, welcome to Inside Sponsorship. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, I know you're a keen listener of the podcast, so you know that these icebreaker questions are already 
coming. I'll get you to properly put some context around Supernova in a minute, but we do know that it encompasses, among other things, comics and gaming. So the first icebreaker question for you is, who do you think is the most underrated superhero? You're going right in on the superhero. I love it. Um, To answer your question, I'm going to go with Aquaman. Mm. I've always wondered why he doesn't have his own movie yet. Well, he he doesn't yet, but in a few months he will. I mean, I've always had a fascination with Aquaman. I guess because me, I, I love the ocean and have grown up surfing and scuba diving and fishing and all of that kind of cool underwater stuff. So, uh, so yeah, I would go with Aquaman. I mean, but most of the superheroes like Batman and Superman and Spider-Man, they get, they get all the love, don't they? <laughs> well, so, ba- uh, Batman's definitely got the best toys. He's got some great toys, yes. So we'll see what comes out with this new movie coming out. Did you know that there's an Aquaman film? Jason Momoa is the star. It's coming out later this year, so it should be pretty darn cool. Excellent. Outstanding. And as I mentioned, Supernova also encompasses gaming. So the second icebreaker question for you is, what was the first ever video game you remember playing? Oh, yeah, video game early on. I mean, I I thought about this, and... Well, I mean, I'm, I can bring us back to the 80s where I was playing Atari and in television. Have you ever heard of that one? No. In television? It was, that was an old school console. Um, so, yeah, those are some of the, you know, in my parents' basement kind of, uh, you know, uh, gaming experiences back in Philadelphia or what I like to call Philly, if you're from there, uh, in, in the U.S. And so, anyway, yeah, some of those and then, one thing, I think the first time I actually got sort of an experience about a gaming addiction where you, you can't wait to get home from work or school or whatever and get to it was in the 90s using a PC, a game that some of your listeners right, might remember called Myst, which was kind of like a role-playing game. And, you know, for those of us out there who geeked out on Myst, you kept your own little journal and unlocked clues and it was uh it was pretty intensive i think it stole three weeks of my life back then so that was that was the first foray into getting really really into a game and and uh although i don't really consider myself a gamer now i i I own a couple consoles and do dabble in some pc gaming but um i know a lot about the industry just kind of working within it but yeah those are some of the great memories of my first gaming stuff very good. Now, Patrick, what's been your journey so far to leading up to your current role? It's been eye-opening in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I, I've had a couple of lives, I like to call them, in business prior to Supernova. I've worked in, uh, most recently, the same industry in the United States, which kind of is how I, I cut my teeth on the mass-ticketed event production and experiential marketing world. So I came to Supernova uh, with a pretty robust bag of, of tools from, from that. Uh, I met the founder of Supernova through a trusted friend uh, who was in business with him at the time, and, and we quickly hit it off. So, uh, you know, he, he took a risk on me in a lot of ways, especially being primarily based in the U.S. And, uh, you know, you know, I was brought on to positively affect the business in a few key kind of revenue-generating ways, but, uh, you know, Supernova, you know, it, it definitely touches on a, a personal passion of mine, which aligns with the founder. I mean, it comes out of, of the founder's world of comic books and, and, you know, a decade plus later has become a real mature and, and thriving business, the largest of its kind in, in Australia. Um, you know, I was blessed on the timing of entering the business as it still had a lot of growth, uh, but it had a foundation that was really incredible. And I noticed that right out of the gate. So, uh, you know, I quickly identified a couple of areas where I can make an Im- impact and sort of an instant impact, specifically building the whole brand sponsorship practice uh, that took what was already there uh, and the national footprint, a passionate audience, a nice little digital platform, and the core business of the six-city major live event tour um, that brings out fans of 
you know, all ages for an experience of their life or certainly an experience of the month and package it all up for brands and agencies to be able to understand and embrace. Um, so it was really kind of a great raw group of assets that I could play with when I got to the company, which is now about two years ago. So, um, you know, to, to quickly touch on some of those areas of impact uh, beyond the brands uh, that I've been able to, to really help is one is selecting and, and attracting A-list TV and film stars uh, to sign up and join our tours uh, as superstar talent and make appearances at our events. So that's, an, as you can imagine, a very important feature of, of our events where fans get to interact, meet and greet, get photo ops and autographs with top film stars and TV stars and other stars. Um, so I've been really able to, to, to bring in some great talent there, talent like Chris Hemsworth, an Aussie boy who, who uh, you know, had his first time ever appearance at a, at a show like ours uh, at Supernova. Guys like David Boreanaz from Buffy and Bones and you know, some of those TV properties. And just recently, a guy, Stephen Amell, who was huge with our audience, who's the star of a TV show called Arrow. Um, so, so that's been another way I've helped impact the business. And, you know, the last thing I'll mention is beyond our Supernova tour, which is really the core of our business, the Six City tour, we also have a thriving event services group and practice where we'll help other intellectual property, oftentimes from other areas of the world, activate their experience in Australia, something we've done successfully recently with a U.S.-based YouTube content studio uh, that we've done a couple of years of events with them. So, you know, the Supernova business has really got a lot of growth ahead, and I'm, I'm happy to be a part. And can you share some of the, the the numbers and the stats around the tour? You mentioned six cities, so there's there's six sort of dates that are that, that are little blocks. But what are some of the other numbers and stats around audiences and and things like that that you can share with us? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, we could talk about some of the specifics of the events um, and some of the numbers. So, like, you know, real quickly. I mentioned the six events, but also let's talk about the the type of and the sizes of the audience. So Sydney, our Sydney show is the largest attended on the tour, and and we're expecting our next uh, Sydney event will do 45,000 plus in attendance. That's one show. So, for instance, over the entire 2019 six-show tour, we would anticipate over 200,000 fans through the doors of our live events. The, The company grew out of being a live event company. So that's still really the core asset of the business and one of the main ways brands are working with us. Um, so we're the largest tour in, in the country, in the industry, uh, with the six shows. And then, you know, some of the specifics around, you know, stats around the audience, I'm sure you'd love to also know, for instance, um, the, the gender breakdown might surprise some people. We're 51% male, 49% female, um, you know, and that's even changed over the last five years, actually. Um, but you'd think it would be much heavier male audience coming out of the whole geek pop culture, uh, but, but really it's trended almost 50-50 male-female. Also, um, some of the other things about the audience, age breakdown would be almost 70% in the sweet spot of that 18 to 45 year old uh, audience with um, 57% 18 to 34 year olds, which uh, as we both know are both key demographic sweet spots. Um, So also another cool thing about Supernova and something we've always done is, and it attracts kids and families, but offering kids 12 and younger free admission to the shows accompanied by an adult. So you can imagine that uh, moms and dads will show up with not only their children, but some friends. And that's uh, been actually a, a, a something Supernova has always done. And I think it's really benefited them long-term because these young fans are becoming fans at a very young age and that continues throughout their lives. So 
Yeah, I mean, that that's 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 really something special in our world. The other thing, other stats I'd, I'd throw out there some, from some of our research that we've done, 93% of fans have told us they'll purchase brands and products associated with Supernova, and 85% of fans are more likely to try brands associated with Supernova, which both of those stats kind of blew my mind having worked in more traditional sports that tout the most passionate fans, uh, you know, especially when it comes to brands and, and our audience is out indexing a lot of those that I've experienced in the past. So it's an intense consumer loyalty and, and, and brands are taking full advantage of that. And is Supernova, is it a growing tour or is it pretty stable year to year? Oh, it's growing. And my philosophy is, I guess, if you're stable, you're, you're dying. So I'm happy to report Supernova is growing. Um, certainly knowing the history, but, you know, over the last two years that I've been involved in being able to witness some of that growth, um, it's, it's been awesome to see. I can't dive too deep into uh, some of the future strategies around the growth, but um, basically, as we discussed um, earlier, gaming is a big part of, of a new infusion to our world. You may have noticed our branding is Supernova, Comic-Con, and gaming. So that's been exciting to see how we've embraced that and brought it into our world, and that's actually brought a whole new sort of uh, segment of the audience to come and enjoy our events and to experience some of the gaming-specific things we're doing. Um, And they've now become kind of loyal followers and digital uh, consumers of ours as well. Um, You know, we're aligning with some of the key endemic uh, gaming brands as part of that as well. Um, and sponsors are embracing that as well. So yeah, the growth has been nice. Um, I'll give you some, some other examples of that. For instance, um, a great new brand relationship uh, on the tours with a console giant Nintendo. Um, just, you know, they just joined the tour for the year Um, in a significant way, in a very cool activation sort of way where their gaming console, the Nintendo Switch, where we have a Switch zone right in the heart of our show floor for fans to engage and play and and play their games. Uh, We have competitions and and things like that, but very much for the fans, with the fans. Um, And and that was that was just started in April. They had a successful uh, experience and decided to continue on with the year as we grow into that relationship. We've also embraced other gaming uh, partners like the publishers. Those are the folks that make the games. So um, we had a publisher just start working with us in a, in a nice way. Bethesda games, for instance, um, looking to engage our national audience and and the, the the newest area of gaming uh, that can't be ignored and is white hot is esports. How much do you know about esports? Well, we've done two shows on esports, so uh, I, I, I like to think I know a little bit more than the average man. But it just it blows my mind at the moment. It's just crazy. Yeah, I caught one of those two shows, a gentleman from the Bombers, and um, we've actually worked with his team, uh, the esports team, who came out to our Melbourne show, and. Uh, you know, in, you know, was part of our show and did some very cool stuff on uh, our show stage. So, um, yeah, it's 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 like I said, it's very very important part of the whole gaming space. And so, we've started partnerships with some of the leaders in the space, whether it's teams, leagues, content producers, uh, event producers, some of the media companies. I mean, really, the de facto leader on the media side is Twitch as you know. So we, we've been, we've been enjoying uh, getting started working with them. And, you know, we, we've, we've invested energy and some money in the space. We actually have a nice partnership with the eSports High Performance Center that's making some waves over at the Sydney Cricket Grounds facility. Um, you may have heard what's going on there, but there's a gentleman there who's a trailblazer in Australia for esports, Dave Harris and Guinevere Capital. So we've we've um, 
you know, started doing some stuff with him, uh, incubated a team that we call Superstellar that uh, it's about diversity and women in gaming. And, uh, you know, that's part of our angle on the esports thing, as well as hosting some of the major esports um, competitions, championships at our live events. And just last month, we had the leader of esports arena style events, ESL, actually produce their two league championships in the heart of our show floor. So it's become the home for esports with ESL's leagues for both CSGO and, and um, Dota 2. So that was really cool and, and a great treat for our fans. I know all the uh, more than a dozen teams that were flown in to, to be a part of that where only two teams could win. Uh, they all had a ball and, and they enjoyed performing, so to speak, in front of this live audience. So it's all happening at the Supernova events and I've spent a lot of time talking about gaming, but that's one area of the many areas of growth that we're focused on. Well, and you start to, obviously, in discussing that growth, talk about partners such as, you know, those gaming brands like Nintendo and publish, publishers like Switch, which are obviously attracted from some of those stats that you shared around 93% of, of Supernova attendees willing to purchase from brands associated with the tour and 85% more likely to try uh, products and services from brands associated with the tour. What does the rest of your portfolio of partners look like? Oh, you mean the other brands we work with? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. So I've already mentioned a few, but but um, let me start with some of the verticals uh, that are taking advantage of our, our live events and our digital platforms. Um, the big brand category would be movie studios. That's sort of an, an obvious one, potentially, but um, that are looking to launch their new theatrical releases. So we work with really all of the studios. Um Studios like Universal, who you just did a very cool both online, you know, digital campaign and an on-site VR experience for fans related to the new Jurassic World movie that just eclipsed $1 billion worldwide and, and Australia being a key, actually overperforming market for, for that title for Universal and Supernova was really one of the key launch partners for the film. So, the movie studio category with uh, you know Universal and Sony and Roadshow and Disney Marvel and and more. Also the TV streaming, uh, obviously TV properties, um, but also the new world of streaming content is is just blowing up. And we've been working with Stan, you know, the Aussie streaming service for for a while. Um, and you know we talked about gaming and not only just the consoles, but the publishers and the peripherals and the products and the hardware and the technology, they are all working with us. Um, you know, retail is always a big category, not only the endemic retailers, but also, um, you know, the, the, the more mainstream, like there's a brand M-Wave that uh, we work with that's a leader in video gaming type tech that's an online only retailer. Um, really the de facto place for, for um, people to go to buy PCs, monitors, peripherals, stuff that you know, is vital to the young tech-savvy gamer. Um, so they're on the tour, and it's awesome to see what they bring for fans to experience at the shows. The huge activation where everybody from Intel to, um, you know, like brands that are kind of, you know, endemic brands like Coolmaster and, and um, HyperX, and MSI, and those are brands a lot of people don't know unless you're really in the thick. Um, but the other verticals, QSR, toys, um, you know, and then there's other, you know, verticals that we, we haven't tapped yet, that haven't joined the tour that we're very anxious to work with. To give you a few of those would be like beverage, energy drink, believe it or not. Uh, travel and hospitality, automotive, wireless, you know, things like that, I think we're, we're a great place for, but it's just a matter of time. You know, in a sense, I came in what, to what was really a blank canvas in a lot of ways um, and, and really had to kind of package it up to translate to the, to the brand decision makers and the agencies. And we're there now. So now it's just a matter of uh, either us finding them or vice versa, which both are happening. Now, you're a self-described 
part-time Aussie, splitting your time between the US and obviously Australia. How much of a challenge is that? Yeah, I'm I'm actually uh, glad you asked about that. It's it's kind of crazy and at times very exciting. I could only I mean it could really only happen today in today's world, right? With with today's technology and Obviously, I'm working in multiple time zones. We're doing business with, uh, you know, brands and studios in multiple countries, as well as obviously our own core business in Australia. So, um, you know, it, it's tough. I mean, I guess to give you a, a little taste, I mean, I, I work with our teams of uh, of people at the company, multiple teams. So we use a lot of third party tools. Uh, we're almost like a, I guess the way you'd imagine, like a team of tech developers who might work in different time zones and pass projects to one another. It's not too different. So we use a lot of great third-party tools, like um, for you know some of these, like Slack for team communication and GoToMeeting for you know so a lot of my B2B calls and video meetings. I use stuff like Active Campaign or Typeform to do research and surveys, and, and the list goes on and on. But that's the kind of stuff that enables you to kind of do well um, while working in you know multiple parts of the world. So I'm I'm getting getting my taste of that <laughs> to answer your question. Uh, I mean, the, and the final thing I'll say is, you know, it's, it's there's some bittersweet elements to it as well. I mean, traveling inevitably. I'm sure you do a lot of traveling as well not just interstate or domestic, but, um, you know, international travel. There's a lot of away time. I've got a wife and two great little girls. So, you know, to take time away from them is, is, is always a challenge. But, um, you know, at the, at the same time, I've kind of cut my teeth in business on traveling and doing business in multiple cities. And, and really, you know, being able to learn the, the whole APAC region, has been awesome for me. And through Supernova, I'm able to do that. And, and I've forged some of the most amazing relationships um, in the region because of that. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost all positive. And you're right. I'm, I do consider myself a part-time Aussie doing five to six trips a year minimum and oftentimes for weeks at a time. Now, Supernova is very much focused on pop culture. How does Supernova identify what content is appropriate for inclusion in the events or, for want of a better word, falls within the scope of what Supernova is all about? Well, in some ways, it's pretty similar to, like, categories of of, uh, media and entertainment that that we choose to exhibit at the shows, but ultimately as far as like what content is appropriate, um, you know, our brand stands for all things, movies, TV, comics, toys, collectibles, um, anime and sci-fi and fantasy games, as we talked about wrestling, uh, cosplay, um, for those of your listeners who don't know what cosplay is, it's sort of the art of dress up which our fans, some of them take very seriously. <laughs> if you've ever walked around uh, uh, one of our shows, you'd see amazing studio quality co- costumes uh, that people on their own creatively make, oftentimes in their garage or home studio. Um, you know, and these are costumes from like Marvel superhero movies, Justice League, DC, or Doctor Who, or Walking Dead, and it, the list goes on. Um, but you know that that's that's sort of a mix of all the content you might see from old classics and you know legendary uh, franchises like Star Wars to new hits like Stranger Things on Netflix or you know. But then um, from a content positioning standpoint, I'll, I'll touch on that. We've always prided ourselves in very family friendly and tasteful type content that's exhibited from trailers that are shown in all the theaters or TV commercials. <clears throat> we'll we'll all be on brand, as well as um, you know we do a lot of original content at the shows in multiple theaters. So from a live event standpoint, we'll if there's PG or M rated content, 
we'll make sure it's uh, done in a, in a way where it's sort of, you know, appropriate, whether it's off the show floor in a theater um, with designated notifications and things like that. So um, family friendly from a content uh, brand perspective and, you know, I, I mentioned all the kind of genres of content that you'd see in the mix around our both events and digital as well. Patrick, what do you think are the benefits that you offer at Supernova that are best placed to help brands connect with what you describe listening to you talk as a really highly engaged audience? And are there any unique ones that you think really set you apart? Having worked in digital media and traditional media, TV, film, print, and now live events, um, I've had a lot of exposure where we are now in consumer marketing. With the information age like fully in bloom, it brings awesome ways to get your impressions in front of consumers. But more and more, I think marketers are realizing that the real life in person experience you know has to be a part of of your mix, and it's always going to trump a digital impression, if you will, that life real life tangible experience. So at Supernova, we're, we're all about, we offer all of it, really. I mean, we come from the live event experience, and now we've wrapped a digital communication set around it as well. So, um, you know, we, we have digital impressions and fan engagement through web-based takeovers and content and other kind of more traditional like EDM, and uh, we're rolling out a mobile app and uh, a new kind of fan engagement mobile app and the ability to produce low cost short form content, um, sometimes even tied to like celebrities and things like that. I mean, social media, online contesting, all that kind of stuff, um, you know, where brands can work with us if they want to choose just a purely digital side or both digital and ad event. I mean, sometimes you know, due to the timing of a launch, um, it doesn't sync with one of our events where it could be purely digital. Um, so, so those are sort of more, I guess, the more traditional ways with hopefully our secret sauce in there as well. Um, and then obviously trying to prescribe a holistic approach where digital engagement is paid off at the live events where one feeds another. That's part of, I think, a unique play, obviously, for us to be strong in both live events, experiential, as well as digital, um, you know, around the data. That's that's what I think we're growing to be more and more. Um, I'll give you an example. We just completed a, a pretty robust campaign with Madame Tussaud Sydney, uh, in which they were launching a brand new Justice League experience at their Darling Harbor location. So we were an obvious fit, and it, I think it quickly became clear to them the perfect launch partner for this new Justice League, they call it a call for heroes experience at the museum. So not to go throughout all the details of it, but it was a campaign that started heavily online and mobile to sort of activate and engage our fans with a payoff at the live event in Sydney, in this case, in which included like a full production at the convention center main stage, which holds thousands of fans, and unveiling one of the DC characters, in this case it was Wonder Woman, the wax figure in front of thousands of fans. Uh, it had a, and then on the heels of that was a whole photo social activation to kind of get way beyond the event. Uh, and that happened in the center of the show floor. And then the final piece was after that event where a few lucky fans through a whole online comp and contesting experience got to attend the exclusive premiere event. So it, it, it started digital, it went live event, it came full circle, had another digital piece, and then actually uh, allowed some lucky winners to be part of the launch. So that's you know one that comes to mind that's a pretty – interesting and unique way to tap what we do, um, you know, in, in, a, in a very unique way. And that was around a launch. We also look at brands that are 12-month-a-year marketers 
and and how do we do things very unique for them that that again have the digital and offline real live event approach with them as well. So hopefully I've I've answered answered your question, but you know we 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 try to look for those unique connections between brand and us that give the fans, the ultimately the consumers, why this is stuff is really happening from a brand perspective, something special. That's our secret sauce. What are your thoughts generally on the event-based sponsorship landscape evolving and outside of just content? What do you see as driving real value to sponsors to entice what we all probably want, those long-term deals with, with sponsors? And generally speaking, not just Supernova, but rather than just short-term campaign events. Well, that's a really complex question in a lot of ways, but it's also sort of simple in other ways. And I, and I, I almost feel like we need a whiteboard session with this one, but let me take a stab at it. Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, what are the aspects of your kind of aspirational learn, long-term deal that builds over time through the working relationship that may be, I, th- I think the one thing to look at is how is it defensible and certainly uh, would have some pain points to walk away from, right? So if you start engaging with a brand and a campaign, uh, you know, especially one that that's a year long campaign, how are you working with them to be a real partner, not just a place to buy spots and dots, but to really make an effect. And then, and then how are you working with them to, in a sense, be somewhat immovable, right? Or, or really important to their mix. I think that's where you start from um, the byproduct of the campaigns you're delivering and, and are gathering data potentially, potentially that's, that's possibly being used by the brand. Um, are you doing research programs with them on top of the campaign to prove the value of you working together? To me, you know, those are the things, you know, pe- marketers are smart, you know, and, and today's day and age, they have to be. So how are you helping them be smarter ultimately? Again, not just, I mean, you've got your your kind of toolbox of standard offerings that brands and agencies can buy, of course, and that's going to be part of the mix. But then what is really, I think, where you got to focus your energy or that, that we try to do that. Um, you know, since, so it's not like the one size fits all um, marketing uh, offering, which which today's world is not. Um, certainly, there's going to have, like I said, those things that they're going to want to tap, whether it's, you know, the basic media stuff that you offer, but, but what are you doing unique beyond that? And how are you really becoming an important part of their their business and business change, you know? So, I mean, you I, I guess ultimately what I'm saying is you want to create an offering that is, of course delivering on all their success metrics, you know, their KPIs, blah, 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 but really trying to carve out something exclusive and special and unique while making sure you deliver on all those, those boxes. Um, so, you know, speaking on behalf of Supernova, uh, you know, as a live event producer, we, you know, we can't do everything end to end for a partner. There's certain things we look to third party partners to, to deliver as part of a program. So that's another thing that I think is kind of critical in the delivery process is oftentimes to fill in some of the areas where you can't satisfy with really trusted quality service providers. Uh, that's another thing that I think can kind of enhance the your delivery and ultimately your success rate on re-upping and growing that relationship. So, I, you know, I, those are some of my thoughts. Um, but, yeah, obviously shooting for evolving a relationship into a long-term uh, deal is, is um, all important. 
Patrick, you mentioned before that the split between male and female is pretty much 50-50. 70% of of people that come to the tour are 18 to 45-year-olds, but really importantly, that sweet spot of the 18 to 34-year-olds are about 57% of your target market. You've got uh, that that offer for 12-year-olds and under to come for free if they're coming with an an adult, which exposes the, the tour to more people and grows your audience and your engagement. All that translates into 93% of people there are willing to purchase brands, services and products who are partnering with Supernova, 85% are more likely to try. That sounds like a really strong position to be speaking to brands from about partnering with you. What sorts of brands are looking to connect with Supernova audience? What sort of brands do you think you are best placed to help? I would say... I'm very excited to work with partners in the travel industry, which is pretty broad, but you can imagine some of the, the, the verticals within, you know, airline would make a great deal of sense. For instance, um, it's a big part of our actual business where we're flying celebrities, we're flying our own, you know, employees and, and folks that work at the live events and, we have a ton of interstate travelers. We actually know some of those numbers. So there's a business case, but also from a brand marketing perspective, it could make a lot of sense and, and really be a lot of fun and, and really a business change type of relationship. So that's an example. Um, but, you know, that's a tough nut, nut to crack, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, they're a they're a tight, challenged industry, so to speak. But I think that would be a natural, and and a hotel partner would be, make a lot of sense on that industry, the travel side. Uh, the financial services is a is a wide open vertical for us, and I've seen it work in other parts of the world at events just like Supernova. Um, so I think you know credit card, bank, you know financial services makes a lot of sense. It's a vertical that's starting to dip their toe on the esports and gaming side of the world. Um, and I guess lastly, I'll touch on would be automotive. Uh, 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 obviously a large um, uh, marketing marketer uh, vertical that has not entered our space yet. I've worked with an automotive, a couple automotive brands in other parts of the world outside of Australia at events very similar to Supernova that have had extremely successful results. So I think that's a natural, um, you know, to bring in the right automotive and brand within uh, to be a first mover uh, on the Supernova Tour makes a lot of sense as well. So those are some verticals that I'm excited to to start to to have dialogue with and and teach them a little bit about, about our world and have them start and learn and grow. Let's flip it for a second. Let's. I, I want to help brands understand the role that, that they can play. Let's say I'm a brand in one of those verticals that you just described. Um, you feel as though we could align well with Supernova in a specific way. What does that look like? All sponsors, ultimately, the end goal is usually to impact their bottom line, but there can be a number of steps that you execute and activate to get to that. What would my objectives generally look like? Is it just generating sales directly from the event? Is it just engaging? Is it building my audience? What would my objectives look like? Sure. I mean, it, it, it's going to be a it's going to be an objective set that's specific to that vertical, that type of company, and 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 certainly you know, what they're trying to get out of it. You mentioned uh, direct-to-consumer sales. That could be a part of it. If I'm a toy company, not only do I want to showcase my products and put products in the hands of uh, potentially young consumers, uh, then I'd want to give moms and dads a chance to potentially purchase the product there. So there's a retail component. The challenges with that industry, as some of your listeners I'm sure know, is, you know, the, the toy manufacturers aren't selling direct, right? They're going through either the big chain retailers or online retailers. or So you have to then connect the dots, right? If that's an agenda point that they not only want to showcase and market, but they want to sell direct, there's two players in the mix, right? So you need a, a, a toy company, the marketer themselves, and then you need a retail partner to transact because um, it's, you know, that, that's, that's just the way the industry rolls. So if that's the case, I'll, I'll approach both. 
and we'll have the marketing team at the brand generate the experiential budget and 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 result and then we'll have the retailer you know if you've ever seen the documentary exit through the gift shop they'll be there to then be the talent, the uh, retail partner on site to make that transaction so you know that that's just one specific example every industry is going to have their own set of challenges that you need to to address but um you know a lot of marketers are there to do what do what that says which is market the product generate awareness excitement so that people leave and either have given us their data or given the brand their data to re to start a digital relationship and or you know they leave with an experience that then translates into uh some transaction in the future, much like I talked about earlier with Universal's Jurassic Park or Jurassic World activation, which was a VR immersive experience that drove excitement to put butts in seats two weeks later. So, Patrick, considering your audience, we've spoken about it a couple of times, those sweet spots of 18 to 45-year-olds, 70%, 57% are 18 to 34-year-olds. You've got a pretty even split with male and female. Considering your audience, do you see yourself as having any direct competitors in the sponsorship space like a football team or other sports teams would have other teams and other sports they compete with because your their audience demographics are so similar? Do you have competitors that have really similar demographics that you think you compete head-to-head with in the sponsorship space? Well, yes, we do. And it might not be as, as I guess, uh, blossomed and mature as, as sort of the traditional sports uh, examples you use, but certainly there are other events. And, you know, if we're talking about just the event side of our business, there's one other competitor in Australia in our space. They, their tour is not as, as many stops as ours. Uh, the audience is, isn't, uh, as large as ours from what I understand, but, um, certainly they're in the mix. And then there's, there's other, um, events, you know, that brands would look at. So there's gaming events and some of them are starting to get pretty sizable. Uh, there's more niche, uh, offerings like anime and things like that. So, um, but, but, you know, if you're talking about sort of the bigger dollar spenders, the more mainstream marketers, um, you know, uh, you did supernova is at an advantage there because of our, our size in our space. Um, it's really just a matter of, translating that to the mainstream marketer mindset, I think, um, you know, and, and, uh, being a place or being known as a place for them to be able to engage mainstream style consumers, uh, and not to be thought of as a, a niche offering. So that, that's really important for us. Um, and as a partner being able to, to, you know, prove that to them, and um, much like they expect from traditional sports leagues and teams and such. Uh, that said, uh, you know, our brand is getting out there and it's uh, becoming interesting to, to a lot of the more, you know, non-endemic marketers. So there's a collection of things that we can do to help that, to make an effect. And, you know, whether it's being all over the mainstream news with, some of the celebrities that are participating in our events, guys like Chris Hemsworth, uh, where you know, the amount of uh, press style publicity impressions is enormous when we bring some A-list talent to our and gets in front of a lot of those kind of mainstream marketers that may not be, you know, paying attention or close attention. It may not be in the community. Oftentimes, some people that are in decision making um, uh, positions will have someone they work with sometimes younger, will have a, a son or daughter or someone in their lives who are very passionate about movies, entertainment that fit the supernova zeitgeist. So inevitably, they'll know about us, but not oftentimes as intimately as, as they'll get to know when they start working with us. So, yeah, I mean, I think competition is, is always there. There's a lot of choices for dollars, as you know. So um, it's, it gets back to... You know, sometimes, especially on the larger, more traditional ad spenders, having a, finding a marketer that's somewhat of a risk taker, wants to be a first mover, and, and that's how sort of a vertical starts to enter the space where it starts with one and then there's sort of a watershed with others that follow. 
positioning supernova as not necessarily being in a in a niche uh and that it is mainstream let's say you identify a brand who you think aligns really well with your audience demographics but they haven't had any known sponsorships in your space before how do you really quickly explain the concept of of supernova and the opportunity without it being dismissed as something gimmicky or too niche or just for kids because it's clearly anything but that these days That's a good question in the fact that without having them attend one of our events, I mean, that would be number one, and oftentimes it doesn't sync up or the timing's off, so you got to quickly educate them and, and, and have them understand that it's not that type of niche offering you mentioned. So, I mean, one great way is through sight, sound, and motion uh, video. So we have a pretty kick-ass sizzle reel that gives you a real breadth of what happens on the tour and showcases what brands are doing on the tour. So that's a good way. Um, you know, we have a, we have a tool that is an online kit that allows people to, to do some of that and get a real kind of, uh, immersive experience. And, um, you know, ultimately sharing a lot of statistics that they probably don't know the size of the audience, the intensity of the consumer habits of the audience, um, you know, all of the all the research really moves the needle. Um, so we 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 certainly want to share all of that. And um, you know, and but like I said, ultimately, and I've done this a lot with brands and agencies is just bring them out to the show. If they're in a city where one of our events is activating, they get on the guest list. They're there as our guest. We oftentimes sprinkle in some some fun special experiences for them, so they really see it through the lens of the consumer and i'll tell you that that is the best way to do it and when they see a family of five all dressed in the same spandex outfits they start to see what the passion is <laughs> now you actually mentioned just a little uh, a minute ago that you'd built a sponsorship focused separate website and i think you told me on the email prior to us having a chat that you were inspired to do that after hearing something in one of uh, our episodes how has that been received by potential sponsors and what has the success been like with it that is true, Dan. You're right. I, I was inspired. I, I, I do listen to many of your shows and get little nuggets of ideas as I listen to others uh, in the space you know, talk about their experiences. So I was been really thinking about how do I get away from the standard, like save it as a PDF and send it as an attachment. And, you know, and, and so I was inspired to work with a, a developer web uh, specialist that I that I know and have known for years, and we put together nothing overly extensive because it's you know in our world it's uh, ADD wins um, the attention deficit audience. So we built this video, primarily video driven experience, which also has a fair amount of details. Uh, it's a, basically an online you know business to business, so it's kind of hidden from the consumer audience, so to speak. Uh, kit where marketers or folks in, in their office can go and on their own, take some time. There's case studies and video, uh, uh, short form videos that tell the story. And then of course, some of the stuff they're most probably interested in, which is how do I buy? What are some of the costs and things like that? So yeah, it's really been a helpful tool that I suggest people go to even if they reach out or we're put in touch and they're interested in speaking, I invite them, of course I don't mandate it, but I invite them to take a minute of their time or a few to comb through that and, and usually they come and say, Wow, you know, I, I learned some stuff I didn't I had no idea the size of your shows or whatever it is. And you know, so all the vitals are there with hopefully some entertainment as well. And at what point in the without making it sound too crude, the sales process, do you show them that site at what point do you send it to them and say it's now time to have a look at that is that early on is it after meetings when's the best time well i like to offer them a chance to look at the sizzle reel and the and the kit the online kit prior to us kind of getting on the phone for an exchange or meeting in person uh although if i'm meeting in person or one of our team is uh we'll just sort of set the meeting, go there and, and sort of put on the show. 
Um, but you know, the, the, there's a process that we like to keep, but again, that varies depending on how it comes in and, and, and what's, what's the, the, the interest level and how much do they know about us and things like that. But, you know, I mentioned a couple of the things and then the other would be, we'll often craft a discovery series of questions to either take them through, which is usually, you know, more beneficial to them and their time or send to them prior to the call if they're farther down the, 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 the funnel, if you will. Um, so that, that's been a, a nice tool for us and it helps us kind of narrow down their, their, their wants and needs and also gives them things to think about and react to. Because uh, what we'll find is a lot of, of um, you know, folks on the marketing side will come in. They don't know everything we know about our business. We always have to remember that. We have to kind of spoon feed certain things and, and pretend that they, they, they don't have all the knowledge we have, certainly, because they don't. So these are some of the tools that help us to do that and also kind of, you know, walk them through the process, which I think they appreciate. So that's them getting into business with us. Once they get into business with us, that's when the other sales side of the process uh, begins about how to keep them and keep them happy and grow it. Patrick, let's take a look at some case studies of work you've done with sponsors, which are actually on that sponsorship focus website that you were just uh, explaining to us. You've got Nerf, M-Wave, Sony, and Twitch as case studies. Let's take a look at M-Wave. What were the objectives of M-Wave? What did they want to achieve? How did they activate their sponsorship? And what did the success look like that they enjoyed? I'd love to answer that. I, I would say also, Daniel, is we should um, offer up the, the site I mentioned on the prior question. I forgot to give the URL in case people wanted to ch- take a look. And, and it's a pretty simple URL, which is sponsor.supernova.com.au. Supernova.com.au is our consumer-facing site. So if you just add the word sponsor dot in front of that, you'd get there. Um, so I invite people to check that out. And to answer your question about specifically for the brand M-Wave, that's a really good one to ask me about because it's a unique type partner in the fact that they're a retailer. So their job is to sell other people's products. They not only want to get their brand out there in front of our consumers as the de facto choice when people are looking for technology-based stuff, but also the brands that they sell within. So they've kind of got a two-pronged initiative that they're always uh, up against. So they sort of co-op market, as you probably are familiar with, with a lot of brands. So it's been a really amazing thing for the company to work with because we're working with the primary retailer, but we're also working with about a dozen brands within that each have their own marketing initiative and each have, quote, chipped in budgetarily to participate in this tour-wide experience. So it's a pretty robust campaign and package uh, for for the tour. Um, so that, that's sort of the overview on it. Um, specifically, M-Wave's all about driving customers to transact on their website. That's why they market, right? So how can we be a great feeder of that and deliverer of that? I mean, one obvious way would be we've got at the events amazing foot traffic of consumers for them to begin a a relationship with. Again, they're a digital-only retailer, so to have a digital ongoing communication makes a lot of sense. So we're doing things with them at their stand, for instance, that allows and encourages fans to sign up and and start that relationship. So through some touch screens around the the massive uh, PC gaming zone is what it's called, uh, fans are encouraged to do that. And through some contesting on site, through some celebrity activations that happen within the zone, through professional gaming influencers that make appearances at the zone, all amongst all this amazing technology that fans are touching and experiencing from MSI gaming laptops with glowing keyboards and the most clear screens you've ever seen to putting on those beautiful 
HyperX gaming headphones to take the noise out while you game on a flat screen. You know, all of this stuff is happening throughout the PC gaming zone for fans to, you know, touch and feel the products, but also, again, give access to, you know, what's ultimately a device in their pocket so that M-Wave can really begin to start that digital communication relationship. So I think we've been really effective for that. This is the second year we tested it last year was so successful. They kind of doubled down and, and, and grew that commitment with us and, and they become really a tentpole brand at our events and digitally between our events as we do some really exciting things with them. So um, hopefully that gives you some nuggets around the case study aspect of it, but a big, big success for us in working with them and the suite of brands. Now, listeners, as Patrick mentioned, he invites you to go and check out those case studies and all the elements that they've put together in that sponsor-focused standalone website. Uh, and there's some awesome videos, as Patrick has mentioned, some awesome-looking sizzle reels and, and things like that. And we'll provide links in the show notes at sponsor.net to take a look. Patrick, if people want to connect with you or learn more about Supernova, what can they do? Well, first they could send me an email. And since this is a uh, industry-specific audience, I'm happy to open that up and invite anyone to shoot me a note who wants to learn more, chat, um, may work at an agency or a brand and wants to, to start to engage. Um, and that's simply patrick at supernova.com.au. Pretty simple. Um, and so that's one way. And then I'm on LinkedIn uh, as well. So you could search me there. And... I would say those are the primary ways and would love to speak with anybody who's interested in any way or an open door to engage with. Very good. Patrick Bradley, Business Development, Brand Partnerships. Thank you so much for taking us inside sponsorship at Supernova. It's been my pleasure and thank you so much for the invitation. Last year on a visit to Melbourne, some friends and I had breakfast near the convention centre and it just happened to be when Supernova was on. I can tell you that some of the costumes the attendees boasted were absolutely phenomenal, simply stunning. So much so, I stopped a few to grab a photograph and while it was a shame I didn't have time to go in and check the expo out, I think it would have been awesome and if you've ever thought about checking it out yourself, then I think it would be well worth your time, not just from an experience point of view, but to get a bit of a closer look at what they're doing around brand partnerships. So head along to Supernova, that's S-U-P-A, nova.com.au for dates and tickets and of course if you want to check out the awesome standalone sponsorship website that patrick spoke about head along to sponsor.supernova s-u-p-a-n-o-v-a.com.au and just note that there is no www at the start of that address of course if you aren't at your desk to punch those addresses in straight away or if you want to connect with patrick simply visit sponsor.net head to the podcast in the resources section and you'll find all the links and examples i spoke about with patrick in the show notes there. Now, if you loved everything about what Patrick described about Supernova and thought, wow, that'd be a really cool rights holder to work for, then you are in luck because Patrick is actually looking for someone to help him out in Australia on the sponsorship sales front. So if that sounds of interest, be sure to connect with Patrick or you can just drop me an email and I'll make an intro for you. Also, don't forget, if you'd like a shout out, just get in contact and I'll make that happen as well. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to connect with me, you can do so on LinkedIn. Just search for Daniel Oyston or drop me an email at daniel at sponserve.net or on Twitter using the handle at sponserve. And if you want to connect with Sponserve's GM product, Sam Irvine, you can email him on sam at sponserve.net and you can also find him on LinkedIn. Don't forget, you can also follow Sponserve on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram. Just search for Sponserve. Until next time, I'm Daniel Oyston. Thanks for listening to Inside Sponsorship. Thanks for listening to the show. For more episodes, blogs and resources, head to Sponserve.net or search for Sponserve on Facebook, Twitter or LinkedIn.